however grand, in China could collapse the global economy. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over something that nobody in the mainstream media is talking about, the Chinese repo market. And just for a little bit of backstory on Evergrande, in case you've been hiding under a rock <laughs> the last couple of weeks, it's this huge real estate company in China that owes over $300 billion and is at risk of default, bringing down their economy and potentially having systemic risks across the globe. But like I said, I think most in the mainstream media aren't seeing the bigger picture. So let's dive right in. It starts with going back to the GFC and Lehman Brothers. One thing the media is saying that may be kind of correct is this could be the next Lehman moment. So let's go back to what actually happened because there's a lot of confusion around the GFC itself. So first, we had Lehman Brothers that had all of these assets on their balance sheet, mortgage-backed securities, treasuries, and asset-backed securities. Well, as we know, those mortgage-backed securities were really backed by housing, and more specifically, the average Joe's ability to pay back those loans. Well, what happened when the rates adjusted upward? The average Joe could no longer afford to make the mortgage payments. That's why he's holding the sign here that says bad times. So he was going through some bad times and this had a ripple effect that brought down the value of mortgage-backed securities. But let's look at reality. Most people assume that like 50% of these mortgage-backed securities went bad. But that isn't really true. Editor, let's go ahead and throw up a chart. And we can see that the average delinquency rate prior and really after the GFC for mortgages, about 4.5%. And during the peak of the crisis, the delinquency rate went up to about 9%. Now, that's a doubling in the delinquency rate, but it's not like it went from 4.5% to 40%, or what the average Joe or Jane out on the street would probably guess it went up to 80% or something astronomical. So this was more of a problem of perception, not really reality, but it sheds light on the fragility of the system itself, the euro dollar system that completely broke down. More on that in just a moment. So Lehman Brothers had all these assets on their balance sheet, but they need cash to function. Their day-to-day -day operations need liquidity. So where do they typically get that liquidity? That would be the repo market. And I've done several videos on the repo market and how it works. We'll put links in the description below. But let's just pretend, for those of you who are newbies to the channel, that Lehman Brothers has farmland. They can't really sell it, but that farmland could have a lot of value. Well, they need to make payroll. So what they do is they borrow against that farmland to get the liquidity they need. And then maybe in the future, they'll go ahead and sell the farmland over a period of time and then pay back the loans. That gives you an example of how the process works. But with the repo market, these are usually just overnight loans or term repos, maybe two or three weeks. So what Lehman Brothers did is they went to the repo market during the crisis and they said, hey, we need to give you some of these mortgage-backed securities as collateral to get the cash, the overnight liquidity we need to stay in business. And the repo market looked at them and said, hell no, <laughs> we are not taking any of your mortgage-backed securities because they looked down at housing prices and they looked at the average Joe, the bad times, and said, hey, we don't know what these mortgage-backed securities are worth if they're worth anything at all. Therefore, we don't want them as collateral. So we've got counterparty 
Pete, we'll call him. So counterparty Pete has the liquidity. He has the cash that Lehman Brothers wants to borrow. But counterparty Pete, who's really about counterparty risk, thinks the risk is too high. He decides not to give Lehman Brothers the cash they need. What happens? Lehman Brothers goes bust. Another way to look at it is Lehman Brothers needed what my good buddy Jeff Snyder, a repo market expert, refers to as pristine collateral. And they had what was pristine collateral on their balance sheet, but almost overnight, that pristine collateral was no longer pristine. So if we think about this in terms of a pie chart and the total collateral within the repo market, let's say we had 75% mortgage-backed securities, and these aren't exact numbers, I'm just using these as an example. So let's say 75% of the collateral used in the repo market was mortgage-backed securities, and then 25% were T-bills. This would be considered by counterparty Pete as pristine collateral or acceptable collateral. But think about what would happen if almost overnight 70% or 75% of the collateral just disappeared. This, as most of you remember, is what almost collapsed the entire global economy. And it really points out the fatal flaw of the dollar funding markets themselves, whether it's repo or the euro dollar market, something I talk about on this channel quite often. And if you want to deep dive on that, you got to check out my good buddy Jeff Snyder and Emil Kalinowski's podcast, Making Sense. But the real problem could be that these markets rely on pristine collateral that at the end of the day might not be that pristine. And on that note, we come right over to what is happening in China right now. They also have a repo market very similar to ours. The trading, a little less, but it's still very substantial. So in the United States, it turns over about $4 trillion a day. Repo market in China, about $400 billion, a little over $400 billion. But it's the same type of setup. We have China Bank right here instead of Lehman Brothers. And China Bank also has assets on their balance sheet that are rather illiquid, so they go into the repo market to get the funding they need, the overnight cash or liquidity. But their quote-unquote pristine collateral is made up of corporate bonds and mortgage-backed securities. Also, a lot of government debt that you don't really have to worry about as much because it's backed up by the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, and the government. To better understand the collateral that's being used by the Chinese banks in the repo market, which could be the canary in the coal mine, let's go right to the internet. First, I'd like to look at a pie chart going back to 2015 that shows the bonds outstanding by issuer and this is in the interbank repo system they have in China. And the system is broken down into two segments, but that's really getting into the weeds. We'll save that for another video. So these charts, these pie charts are broken down by the bonds outstanding by issuer and then the collateral pool by issuer. So the collateral pool would give us a better idea of what was being used back in 2015. But I want to look at the left side here to point out the actual bonds that were outstanding. So we have Ministry of Finance and the People's Bank of China. This most likely is government debt. And I say most likely because it's, it's very difficult to research China. Uh, not only do I not speak Chinese, <laughs> but the, the information is very esoteric if you can even find it. So uh, we'll go ahead and assume that these are government bonds, which would also be backed up by the fine print. Interbank collateral is dominated by highly rated government, policy bank, and state-owned enterprise bonds. Okay, so... Going back to the outstanding debt, we see government debt, local debt, CDs, 
Financial bonds. This is interesting. Initially, I thought these were mortgage-backed securities, but they're not. If we read this footnote, it says financial bonds include bank and broker bonds, but are predominantly 86% policy bank bonds. And I looked up what policy bank bonds mean, and they were not mortgage-backed securities. We have enterprise bonds. Uh, that would be corporate debt, most likely. Medium-term note, corporate debt, commercial paper, corporate debt. Asset-backed securities, just like we had in the United States, but only 1% government agency. Um, again, here in the United States, that could be mortgage-backed securities because they're coming from Fannie and Freddie. In China, not too sure. Private placements, that's interesting. But then when we look at the collateral being used, then we see it is the government debt and then these financial bonds. That's the majority of it. And then we've got about 11% or so of corporate debt. But what's really interesting is when we fast forward to 2019. Here, I have a chart of the boom in RMBS, residential mortgage-backed securities in China. So back in 2005, 2006, they were just testing the waters, so to speak, with these mortgage-backed securities. Then they went into the ice age, <laughs> the restart in recovery. But since 2016, these mortgage-backed securities have been booming. The products have developed rapidly. The issuance size in 2016 is basically comparable to that of CLO products or collateralized loan obligations. Residential mortgage-backed securities products have been the main product on the interbank securitization market since 2017. The reason I wanted to point this out and why it could be a canary in the coal mine is going back to 2015, they really didn't use mortgage-backed securities, as far as I can tell, in the repo market. But that most likely changed significantly in 2016 to 2021, when according to this article, the amount of mortgages securitized went parabolic. So you would also assume that the amount of mortgages or mortgage-backed securities being used in the repo market for collateral would also boom. But going back to the whiteboard example, I think it's safe to assume the counterparties involved in the repo transactions, those who are providing the cash, providing the liquidity, don't understand mortgage-backed securities as well as we understand them in the United States. Therefore, those providing the liquidity or the cash could be even more risk averse if there's a slight downturn in the real estate market, which would leave the banks that aren't owned by the government in a very difficult position, a similar position to Lehman Brothers in 2008. For right now, let's focus on these corporate bonds because that plays directly into what's happening with Evergrande. See, Evergrande is a real estate company. They are not a bank like Lehman Brothers. So comparing them directly isn't really accurate. But even though Evergrande isn't a bank, they've got a heck of a lot of debt, Three hundred billion. So that's a lot of bonds that they could be issuing or loans that they're getting directly from banks that are securitizing those loans and using them for collateral in the repo market. And then let's think through the way the Chinese real estate market works. A lot of people in China buy apartments or houses prior to them even being built. And the average cost of a house or apartment, especially in the major cities in China, is astronomical. I was reading a statistic the other day that showed that in some areas, housing, the average housing price is 46 times the average income. Residents in China have accepted that homes cost as much as 46 times what the average worker makes in a year. Let that sink in for a moment. That means if you're making $100,000 a year, the average cost of a house in your area is $4.6 million. That is what I call a real estate bubble. So you have all these people that are completely dependent upon 
capital appreciation. In other words, their housing price continuing to go up, which basically bails them out of this loan that they have that they could never ever pay back. And let's also remember that real estate is 20 to 30% of the total GDP in China, an astronomical number. So what happens when Evergrande can't make good on the promise or all the deposits they've taken for let's say a million apartment units? What does that do as far as a ripple effect throughout the rest of the Chinese housing market? If that brings down prices at all, you could see a huge domino effect with people not paying back their mortgages, which would transfer over to the assets on the balance sheets of the banks themselves. And therefore, we've got, it's not counterparty Pete, but we've got counterparty Ping. That is right, Pete's Chinese cousin. <laughs> we'll call him. He's in the same business as Pete is. So Ping looks at what's happening with Evergrande and he understands the systemic risks throughout the rest of the economy and the real estate market. So when the Chinese bank goes to Ping to get the liquidity they need, and they say, here, Ping, we'll give you these mortgage-backed securities, what does Ping say? The exact same thing that Pete said over here. Hell no, I don't want any of your mortgage-backed securities because I don't know what the value of those mortgages are going to be in two or three weeks. And then they say, okay, Ping, well, we'll give you these corporate bonds. And he says, absolutely not. I don't want those either because those are backed by entities like Evergrande that could collapse in two or three weeks. So just like over here, Pete looks at the situation and says, no way, Jose. Over here, Ping looks at the exact same setup in China and says, no way, Zhang. I guess that's Chinese for Jose. At least that's what I'm guessing. <laughs> so we have Evergrande potentially leading to a housing debacle in China, just like we saw in the United States, which led to the bad times here and the bad times for China Cho, the average Joe's Chinese cousin. And this is my best rendition of Chinese. We'll assume that that says bad times. This is a skinny house for skinny people. This is a fat house for fat people. <laughs> Americans, I gotta call you out on that. So the main takeaway is the risks that we saw in the United States market that brought down Lehman and almost collapsed the global economy prior to the GFC are very similar to the risks that we're currently seeing in China. And especially when you look at it through the lens of the repo market, you see that although there are no certainties, there are only probabilities, there's a significant probability that history will repeat itself. This was the GFC, and this could be the GFC 2.0. Whoa, time out. I know right about now your friend and family member Fred is saying, George, you have absolutely lost your mind. The Chinese banks will never go bust because they're owned by the government. Well, unfortunately, your friend and family member Fred doesn't really understand the Chinese market. Editor, let's go straight to Wikipedia and we can easily see that there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of banks that are in China that are not owned by the Chinese government. In fact, I had a conversation the other day with banking expert Richard Warner, who pointed out China is second only to the United States when you look at how many banks they have in the country. So although you do have some of the banks in China that are owned by the government, you also have many of the banks HSBC and JP Morgan are the first that come to mind that are not owned by the government, therefore could very easily fail just like Lehman Brothers did 
back in 2008. Step number two, late stage capitalism and communism. In step number one, we talked about how Evergrande could crush the Chinese repo market, bringing down their banking system and collapsing their economy. But most of you may come to the conclusion that the probability of that affecting the global economy is a lot less than what we saw during the GFC because it was centralized in the United States, therefore revolved around the dollar that has a much greater impact on the global economy than China currently does right now. And I'm going to push back on that in step number three. But in order to understand the bigger picture, the macroeconomic picture of what is happening right now with Evergrande in China, we have to understand what late stage capitalism is. Let me explain. I have this timeline that I put up on the board, and this was given to us by a gentleman by the name of Karl Marx. And he came up with this concept on how to create a socialist utopia. Now, I'm going to use socialism and communism kind of interchangeably. I guess we should just use Marxism and call it good. But his idea is that you would start with feudalism. This is where we have a lord and a serf. But the next stage of economic development that would improve the living standards for society at large would be capitalism. Marx saw all the industrialists of the time in the United States and in the West creating all of this wealth and creating jobs for their workers. So Marx, contrary to popular belief, didn't hate capitalism at all. He saw it as a useful tool. But you couldn't go from feudalism to socialism or communism without implementing capitalism first, because the capitalists are very good at creating goods and services. But he saw a problem, that as capitalism progressed, you would get to a point of late stage capitalism or end stage capitalism. This actually was not Marx's term, but it was a name given by Marxists later on in the future. So in late stage capitalism, it's this process where the capitalists that own the business are trying to squeeze more and more profits, but they're doing so by reducing the wages of the workers who are actually their customers. So inadvertently, they're going to be destroying their own profits because they're paying the workers who are the customers less and less and less. If the workers themselves have less disposable income, they're spending less money with the capitalist. That means lower revenues and lower profits. So the capitalist is going to seek out other opportunities to make more and more money. How are they going to do that? By speculating on financial assets. So when you see what happened in the United States in 2008 during the GFC or the dot-com bust, or maybe even long-term capital management blow-up in the late 1990s, or you see what's happening today in China with Evergrande, the Marxist would see that as a sign of late-stage capitalism. And in their view, if you allow late-stage capitalism to continue, it will completely feed on itself to the point where the whole entire system collapses and society goes right back to a stage that's very similar to feudalism and they have to start the whole process over again. Unless the revolutionaries come in and take over the means of production from the capitalists themselves. Then, once the communists, the socialists, or the Marxists are in charge, they can create this workers' paradise and socialist utopia building on the foundation that was built by the capitalists themselves. So just to review, according to Marx, it starts off with feudalism. We have a lord and a serf. 
Then the capitalists come in with capitalism. They create all of this wonderful industry and these jobs. So the capitalists are very happy then, but the workers, eh, kind of not so much. Then we get into late stage capitalism where the revolutionaries come in with their torches and pitchforks. They burn everything to the ground. They take over the means of production using whatever means necessary. Then the workers are extremely happy because the revolutionaries take over power and build this worker's paradise and socialist utopia. So a lot of you right now are probably saying, okay, George, I get it. I understand how late stage capitalism works, but what does this have to do with China right now, Evergrande, and the collapse or potential collapse of the global economy? To answer that question, let's go back in time to 1976, when China has a new leader. His name, Deng Xiaoping. So Deng Xiaoping studied communism and Marxism actually under Lenin in the 1920s. You could say he is definitely an OG <laughs> of communism. But when he took power in 1976, according to Richard Warner, going back to that conversation I had with him the other day, he said that Deng Xiaoping looked around him, specifically what was happening in Japan with their booming industry and in Germany. And he came to the conclusion that China actually needed more capitalism to achieve their socialist utopia. But that's not where the story ends. Think about what happened in 1991 when communist Russia collapsed. Well, the Communist Party in China, including Deng Xiaoping, had to look at that and say, what on earth just happened? Because if it could happen to Russia, maybe it could happen right here in China as well. So he sent his economists into Russia to figure out what made the House of Cards collapse. And their conclusion was not that communism is a flawed ideology. Their conclusion was that in Russia, communist Russia, they didn't implement capitalism soon enough. They tried to go from feudalism straight into socialism. Therefore, Deng Xiaoping continued forward with all of the policies that he started implementing in 1976, freeing up the economy and creating a system of capitalism. But as most of you know, Deng Xiaoping is no longer the leader in China. It's Xi Jinping, and he is taking a different approach than his predecessor. Or it may be the same game plan. The Chinese are notorious for implementing these 50, 100 year plans and then executing them methodically. But whether or not Xi Jinping is implementing the same plan as Deng Xiaoping, or he changed it altogether, that doesn't really matter. The bottom line is he believes most likely that China has moved into late stage capitalism. And you can tell by his actions. What has he been doing lately? He has been taking a more authoritarian approach and reining in all of the capitalists, letting them know he is in charge. Some would say he's moving closer to socialism, trying to go back in time to a point prior to Deng Xiaoping creating the reforms in the first place. Editor, let's cut to a CNBC clip of Kyle Bass further articulating my point. The moves that she is making right now are, are possibly an impediment to Chinese growth, which would be theoretically good for the world. I mean, the, the six biggest companies have already lost a trillion dollars in value. Uh, they're talking about, there's a quote in the journal that says, the big risk for China is Mr. Xi suppresses much of the entrepreneurial energy and innovation coming out of China if they become much more government-centric and, and much more socialist, in other words, which, which we're, we're grappling with here ourselves. I mean, is that the worry that, that, 
that China transforms itself back to the way it was before it embraced capitalism? Yeah, I mean, look what they've done to their gaming sector. Look what they did to their for-profit education sector. They've, ba they've basically pulled the plug on many sectors in their economy. They're reining in tech. They're requiring 50% of profits or more on top of their tax rate of companies like Alibaba and Tencent for the, for the quote, common prosperity. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that Xi Jinping is implementing this plan and these are his reasons. I can't get into the guy's head. All I'm doing is looking what happened starting in 1976, in 1991, and then seeing their actions today and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. But to the end of the day, like I always say, there are no certainties, only probabilities. I can just present my ideas and the information to you, but at the end of the day, you, the viewer, have to draw your own conclusions. But unfortunately for the Chinese and the global economy, there is a big problem. What happens when you go from this late stage capitalism to the socialist utopia, it requires an authoritarian approach. The revolutionaries have to come in and create the revolution. But what ends up happening is the revolutionaries never want to give up control. They never want to move to that egalitarian society that they promised. The egalitarian society that Marx believed we would transition into. So it turns into this never-ending cycle of authoritarianism and micromanagement of the economy, which creates lower economic output and a lower standard of living. It's this positive feedback loop down and down and down, a doom loop, if you will, where the central planners try to take control, but this reduces the amount of goods and services created by the society, making them far poorer. And as a result of them being poor, they vote for the people who are going to give them more free stuff. And those are the central planners that created the problem in the first place. And to illustrate this point further, let's go to a clip from Making Sense, the podcast I was talking about earlier for my good friends, Emil Kalinowski and Jeff Snyder. In all of these examples, and we include communist China in the same example, who, by the way, got in the same, the same, same exact situation as Russia, the Chinese under Mao, uh, they went, underwent their socialist revolution too soon. They jumped the gun there too. China was by no means an industrial wealthy society. In fact, they were worse off than the Russians were in 1917. But the point is, what the, what the Marxists have to do is transition from a capitalist society to this, this workers' paradise utopia, and that requires this brutal authoritarian regime to do it. And, on, and that brutal authoritarian regime erases all prior history. They start at year zero, and everything goes forward from there. And the, what makes communism so evil is that they essentially lock human society into that situation under the brutal authoritarian regime because there is no utopia. There is no end point where the authoritarians say, we've made it to the paradise, we're giving up all authority. So as soon as you undergo, whether it's, it's, it's too soon or at the right time, whatever the hell the right time might be, as soon as you undergo the socialist transition, hand everything over to these small elite group of revolutionaries and give them authoritarian, arbitrary authoritarian power, they're never going to give it up because they can't. There is no utopia. There is no society on the other side where it's completely equitable, flat structure, perfect commune. That's really the point here is that it doesn't, that's the, that's the theory is that once you go into the transition, whether you started early, whether you start at the right time, you're stuck with the, always the transition. That was the real lesson from the Soviet Union and the real lesson from China that we're seeing today. Step number three, the GFC 2.0 end game. Now is the time to connect all the dots. And I know most of you are probably saying, oh my gosh, George, this is definitely stiff drink time <laughs> because this is where it gets really heavy and intense. But you would be wrong. 
because I don't want you to pour yourself a stiff drink. I need you to put on your thinking cap because we are really going to get into the weeds about how the global monetary system actually works so you can figure out the probabilities of Evergrande in China creating a global economic collapse. So let's dive right in. First, I want to review steps one and two. We talked about Evergrande real estate and the Chinese repo market really causing a financial crisis in China. In step number two, we talked about how it seems like they are transitioning back into a model of central planning, trying to create this socialist utopia. And if they do, that is going to decrease economic output. But one thing I want to point out before we move any further is that a collapse in China isn't really necessary to create a global economic collapse. That's what we're going to get into throughout the rest of this video when I explain the whiteboard. In a perfect storm situation, the only prerequisite would be China going into a deep recession or depression. This is absolutely key. Now I need you to put that thinking cap on because we've got some required knowledge and some crucial data to go over so you can get your head around how this system actually works and what the downside risks could be. First, I want to talk about credit demand and deflation. We always hear deflation, prices going down, as the ultimate boogeyman. But if you study 1800s, if you truly know economics, you realize that prices going down in and of itself is not a bad thing. In fact, that's a good thing. So what determines whether deflation is bad or if deflation is good? It all boils down to if the deflation leads to a drop in demand. See, in a healthy economy that isn't levered up, if prices go down, that actually increases demand. But if you've got an economy that's levered to the hilt, where they've extended all of this credit and the balance sheets have all the debt on the liability side, then if prices go down, it makes it harder to pay back the debt. We get all of these defaults, then demand decreases, bringing down the entire house of cards. Next, like Ray Dalio says in his video, The Economic Machine, one man's spending is another man's income. Editor, let's cut to the clip. Spending drives the economy. This is because one person's spending is another person's income. The third component of required knowledge is understanding velocity. A lot of people think that if $20 of debt goes into the system, then it requires more than $20 of debt to actually pay back the loan in full. Why? Because you have the principal balance of $20 plus whatever interest is due on the loan. But that's incorrect. What we have to understand, and I don't want to go into the, the weeds on this, but you got to trust me on this one, <laughs> that $20 of debt can actually be paid back with less dollars. $20 of debt, theoretically, could be paid back with only $10. What's required is that the velocity of the money circulating in the economy is high enough. If velocity is high, then the amount of dollars necessary to pay back, let's say dollar-denominated debt, is lower. If velocity goes down, then the amount of dollars required to pay back the same amount of debt goes up. Before we move on, another thing I want to point out about credit demand and deflation is in economies like the United States and China that have now become so financialized and reliant on asset prices going up and up and up, such as the stock market and real estate, if you get that deflation, decreased demand, you also have a decrease in credit. And the reason the asset prices have gone up in the first place is because an extension of credit. Therefore, if credit contracts, then asset prices will come down 
and decrease demand even further. Now let's go ahead and move on to the crucial data. Dollar denominated trade represents over 50% of global transactions. So think that through. If you have Saudi Arabia trading oil to Colombia, that's done in dollars. Another way to look at it is if you have China importing goods from other countries, such as Australia, there's a high probability that the transaction will be settled in dollars. So the next question becomes, how many trading partners does China actually have? This would give us an idea of the magnitude of them importing goods and services, therefore exporting dollars that could circulate in the global economy. So editor, let's go ahead and pull up a chart of China's trading partners, and we can scroll down this list, and you can see that China is really doing business with almost every country in the world. And these transactions represent over $2 trillion a year. And I want to be very clear, not all those transactions are settled in dollars, but it's safe to say that a large percentage of them are settled in dollars. The next crucial data point is how much dollar denominated debt exists outside of the United States. A lot of these corporations and countries themselves are borrowing in dollars to buy the widgets or the supplies they need to create the products to export or to sell to their customers locally. Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart. We can see that global dollar denominated debt outside the United States is up around $12 trillion. This creates a lot of demand for dollar cash flow to pay back those loans. To help you better visualize how this works, let's go to some diagrams I drew earlier. We've got China right at the top. So they're importing all of these goods and services from businesses around the world. And they're paying for a lot of those goods and services in dollars. So those dollars go to this business, let's say directly, but this business has suppliers, other businesses below them. And those businesses have businesses below them that supply them with the goods and services they need to create the widgets that they use to sell the products to this business that this business sells to China to get the dollars in the first place. So if this was an accurate representation, you would have literally thousands and thousands and thousands, maybe millions of businesses that are importing to China and they would have millions of businesses under them and most of these entities would be transacting in US dollars. So they have a lot of dollar denominated cash flow coming in, which is a good thing because let's remember, they have a lot of dollar denominated debt, about 12 trillion outstanding as we speak. So they use a lot of the dollars they're getting from China to make their debt payments back to the bank. And this frees up the balance sheet capacity for the bank to make more dollar denominated loans. This is a simplistic version of the Euro dollar system. So if this bank is able to create more dollar denominated loans, they can extend more credit to these businesses that are trying to grow or maybe new startups that need dollar denominated capital to hire employees or to buy supplies they need to create those widgets. So productivity increases, the amount of goods and services increase, and let's not forget about liquidity. We talked about this in step number one. If the bank has additional balance sheet capacity, they can extend short-term loans that gives these businesses the liquidity they need to continue to move forward. Just like Lehman Brothers or China Bank or Evergrande right now, if they don't have access to liquidity, many of them go bust. So the dollar debt payments go to the bank, their balance sheet initially, assets on the left, liabilities on the right, 
their assets, let's say, are loans, but if they get those loans paid back, now the asset side of their balance sheet doesn't have loans anymore that they've given to all of the businesses, but now those loans have been replaced with bank reserves and most likely dollar denominated bank reserves. Now they don't actually lend out these dollars, but like we were saying earlier, that gives them additional balance sheet capacity to extend more credit, create more loans, which gives these businesses the ability to grow and gives them the liquidity they need to survive. But what happens if China goes into a significant recession or a depression? Then fewer dollars are coming out because less imports are going in. And one man's spending is another man's income. So if the dollar denominated income or cash flow from these businesses disappear, then their ability to pay back the loans disappear. That means default. Then what happens is these banks can't offer the liquidity to the other corporations and they can't offer other debt to new corporations that are starting or trying to expand their business by increasing productivity. Therefore, the euro dollar system starts to break down. We see a deflationary debt deleveraging, very similar to what we saw in GFC 1.0. And this brings me to the next step, which is not a doom vortex. Oh no, this is far more complex, but it's vital that you get your head around this. So I've got a new term for what we're doing here. It's not a doom vortex. This is a doom matrix. So the doom matrix starts off at the top with demand and spending. If this goes down, the incomes that these entities are receiving in dollars goes down. Well, if their dollar income goes down, then their debt burden that they owe the bank increases. If their debt burden increases and they don't have enough dollars to make those loan payments, what do they have to do? A lot of them will have to access the FX market. So what that means is they'll take some of the cash flow that they have that's coming in in their local currency and they will trade it for dollars to make those loan payments to the bank. But what does this do to the relationship between the two currencies? Well, there's more demand for dollars, but there's also additional supply of the pesos, yen, euro, or whatever the local currency is that they're trading for the dollars. That means the value of the dollar relative to their local currency goes up, which exacerbates the problem even further. So their local currency goes down, the dollar goes up, and this goes right back into creating an even bigger debt burden, denominated in dollars, than they had before. Then we move over and this creates defaults. So defaults in the banking system, the euro dollar system, go up. And this creates less balance sheet capacity or BS capacity, <laughs> whichever you prefer. Lower amounts of balance sheet capacity equal more defaults. And this transitions or goes right up to velocity decreasing. And remember what we talked about over here, if velocity decreases, then the amount of dollars needed to service the same amount of debt increases. So lower velocity would also increase the debt burden, which by now is skyrocketing. And it would take us right back into this mini doom loop because lower velocity means that those entities would have to trade more of their local currency for the dollars which would make the value of the dollar go up, the value of their currency go down, and that increases the debt burden even more. But the carnage from the lower velocity doesn't stop there. It would also lead to less demand and less spending, which brings us right back to the top of the doom matrix. It creates a feedback loop where every time you go around, the problem gets worse and worse and worse. This could result in a biblical sized 
global debt deleveraging, which could bring down the entire system. It would crush asset prices, which so many economies have been built on. It would destroy and further break the euro dollar system, and it would lead us to GFC 2.0. But this time, the Fed and the global central banks might not be able to bail us out. And all of this could be triggered by a recession or depression in China that leads us to a collapse of the global economy. And what's amazing is that all those people in the mainstream media don't understand this. They don't get it. But the good news is now you do. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. And I will see you on the next video.